Hello, I am Alexandre Tanous, the principal founder of the Sound Mind Collective. I'm a musician, composer, educator, conductor, and ethnomusicologist by training. And 19 years ago, I started a research on the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound and thus became a sound practitioner and sound researcher. Aside from creating the vision, the direction, and the ethos of the collective, I will be offering the following guided meditation and guided uh, visualization and teaching how to enhance mindfulness, breath work, facilitating sound meditations, coaching with self-awareness, guided perceptions, um, self-observation, critical thinking and creative strategies that can be applied to self-healing, educational transmission on sound, spirituality and consciousness. Greetings, this is Dennis McKenna and I'm an ethnopharmacologist, a long time researcher into psychedelic medicines, both as a scientist as, and as a personal quest. Uh, I'm a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute and recently founded an academy called the McKenna Academy for Natural Philosophy. I'm very honored to be invited to participate in the Sound Mind Collective. Alexandre is a good friend and a mentor of many years, and I think this is going to be a very exciting endeavor, contribution of talents and wisdom and insights from many different sectors. So I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you and sharing and what we can teach each other. Thank you very much. So we're super fortunate to be joined with Alexandra and, and Dennis, uh, two people who've had many conversations together over the years and know each other well. Uh, we have not so much time for the amount of conversation and topics that we could cover here. So uh, I'm, I want to start with maybe a, a provocative word in a way, but a, a word that uh, speaks to consciousness in terms of neurogenesis. Let's talk about neurogenesis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. So does everyone know what neurogenesis means? Maybe, maybe uh, not. What does neurogenesis well, neuro mean? Neurogenesis is uh, the stimulation of the growth of new neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's it, it recent discovers and not not so recent, but uh, 20th century, 21st century discoveries in neuroscience shows that the brain is extremely plastic, uh, the concept of neuroplasticity. It, it, the older model used to be that you were born with a certain complement of neurons and uh, it was downhill from there. In other words, neurons started dying off as soon as you were born so that you had progressively fewer and fewer of them. That's not how we understand the brain to work anymore. We realize that the brain is uh, involved in dynamic interactions with its environment, what you might call learning, and learning can actually change the connections and the configuration and even the number of neurons. And uh, so the neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to adapt and evolve, even in older people like myself, we still can adapt to uh, new, new information. And uh, another significant finding that's, uh, that's coming to light is that psychedelics, particularly psilocybin and some of the other tryptamines, can actually stimulate neurogenesis. It stimulates in the acute phase, it stimulates hyperconnectivity, hyper, uh, hyper amped exchange of information. And uh, I'm not sure why I can't stay centered here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you're uh, migrating a bit. <laughs> ex exchange of information, 
and then though that experience can actually entrain these new connections that's why uh the therapeutic effects of psilocybin uh outlast the actual therapeutic session so the the uh in the creation and entrainment of these hyper connections continues in the brain can actually reset the brain to a different modality so that's the power of these uh, of, of psychedelics uh, on a therapeutic level. Um, I keep yes, moving so myself. Oh, here maybe if I did it. There you go. That's good. That's nice. That's, that's so good. yes. Now, uh, adaptiveness, move, adaptiveness, and entrainment. These are incredibly crucial, relevant aspects of our experience right now. Wouldn't wouldn't you say so, Alexandre? Yes, absolutely. Um, at the end, what's important is really paying attention to where our attention and intentions are going because that's what creates reality. Um, and so basically, um, repeated action can create the neuroplasticity that we need, which create the specialization of the brain, which is connected to neurogenesis that Dennis was talking about. So it's very important to pay attention to to the fact that energy flows where attention goes. And this is the whole point of this collective is to focus on nurturing the self, to pay attention to how people are um, being impacted by what's going on in the world and not to fall into reptilian brain behavior where the person retreats, the person becomes fearful, but instead to focus on uh, the positive aspect to to use this as a this period as a, as a, as a retreat for introspection and um, focusing on healthy practices, uh, meditation, contemplation, mindfulness, and all the things that um, this collective is providing to people to support them. It's very important to preserve harmony. Harmony is community. Community is harmony. And yes. there's nothing better than sound as a tool. To uh, tool to impact the neuroplasticity theory is interfering. Sorry, that's okay. So maybe you can say uh, more about that. How does sound impact our neuroplasticity? Um, it's a very mysterious thing what sound does to our brainwave cycles. Our heart rate variability, the way it impacts the, the vagus nerve, the autonomic nervous system. And that is the reason why we intuitively, as human beings, gravitate toward music, to use music in all sorts of different settings in different environments, whether the spiritual, um, the, the shamanic, the traditional, the religious. Music is indispensable. And I've, as a person who studied various aspects of music, I've always been intrigued by why music? Why why music is the most popular accessible art? What does it do to our consciousness? Seems like we are encoded to unravel consciousness, unravel who we are and learn about who we are. Why? Because at the end, this power that music has comes from the harmonic series, which is one of the most important mathematical constants in the universe. And at the end, it's physics. It's acoustics. Acoustics is the... Um, study in physics that focuses on sound and vibration. So we're impacted by it through entrainment. As we listen to music, we start to move with sympathetic resonance and eventually start to dance. This is how entrainment happens. Music can also make us go into a deep, introspective, meditative, contemplative state, whether for prayers or, or meditation. So we've learned to use music and adapt it to various reasons. And therefore, it's very important to understand how this power works so that we can use it in a, in a focused way as a, as a powerful tool um, to understand who we are. Yes. So, Dennis, I, I'm wondering in terms of living systems, do we have good reference points for how har harmonics are integrated and, and used adaptively in living systems? Well, um, <laughs> this is a bit beyond my, my pay grade, uh, but uh, I can speculate. I think, yes, I think that uh, harmonics on many levels and between many species is uh, obviously integral to, 
communication systems. Look at, for example, whale songs. You know, uh, try to imagine whales have brains that are 10 times bigger than we are, you know, and that, that our brains, that is, and probably than us. So they have actually very complex brains, but imagine they communicate through acoustics. Imagine the acoustic environment in the ocean that must be inhabited by whales. I think it's a very different kind of sensory vessel. And, you know, you look at bird songs, you look at, uh, you know, many other things, insect communications, all of that is very much about acoustics and about, about sound. So, you know, and resonance and sound forms the basis for all kinds of natural, natural phenomena. You know, we are immersed in sound. And, and I think when it comes to, you know, that old cliche about set and setting, still trying to get in the middle here, uh, it, 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 for psychedelics, it's important. Psychedelics and similar, I guess you could say consciousness uh, modulating procedures like sound, sound healing, uh, these are vessels, essentially vessels the concept of set and setting you can think of as a vessel. It's, it's a creation of optimal conditions where these altered states can unfold to optimum effect, to optimum benefit. I mean, you can create sets and settings that re reinforce negative, negative ideas, negative vibrations. But the point is that uh, the proper use of harmonics and acoustics in, in these settings helps to optimize them, you know, optimize the experience. And, and what we're really trying to do is achieve a reset, essentially, in our consciousness. You know, one of the benefits of psychedelics is that they temporarily disable what we call or what has come to be called the default mode network. And the default mode network, in a very simple way, can be thought of as the box you create around yourself, and the box most of us inhabit most of the time, which is a, a constructed reality based on habits and experience and sensory data and memory and all of these things that the brain does to put together a model of reality that is coherent to us and that we can navigate in. And a lot of what goes on is the brain filters out a lot of information. If, it, if all of it got in, it would be just a blooming, buzzing confusion. So the brain is very capable of, of selectively filtering what gets out so it can essentially produce a narrative for itself of this is my reality. You know, and most of the time we're in that box that we create because it's quite useful. You know, it lets us navigate. Occasionally, we need to step outside of it and look at look at it from a broader perspective. That's what acoustic uh, acoustic environments, such as Alexandre specializes in, and or psychedelics can do. They can temporarily lower those gating me mechanisms. They let information in that's normally blocked, and then you can integrate that and process it. It is really very much like rebooting a computer, you know, in the sense that you you restart when it comes back up again. A lot of the cludge that has accumulated in the system is gone, so it's a way to cleanse the system and make it work more efficiently. Yes. So in terms of set and setting, it's very important in terms in terms of. Uh, creating the container whereby noise gets adapted into harmo harmony, potentially. That there is this transformative process that brings us forward. By going in, we can expand our senses, we can, we can um, process that technology. Is, and, and in a way, I feel like sound is the original information technology. Alexandre, how, yes. how, does, how do we go, how do we bridge <laughs> in terms of being in the box to stepping out of the box with sound. How does it help us go in as well as expand? Mm -hmm. It seems to be that this 
powerful force that we call the harmonic series. This is the place where the concept of harmony comes from. And the harmonic series is an infinite series of various frequencies that are bound together by mathematical ratios. This is the place where the concept of harmony, pure harmony, comes from, and it's intricately connected to mathematics. And um, it's, it's not an accident that we always find sound being um, the creator of reality. All religious books, uh, whether the Old Testament and New Testament, start with the idea that sound is God, sound creates reality. In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Genesis starts with the idea that God is saying, let there be light, and there was light. So that means sound creates reality. In Eastern philosophies, it's a primordial aum that created the universe. So this has a very deep esoteric aspect. I won't go there, that the Pythagoreans and the Neoplatonists were deeply interested in. So sound seems to be, in this case, the harmonic series, the, the blueprint of sound, seems to be helping people shifting the noise to signal ratio, quieting the mind. With that, we're able to let go of the misguided perception that our consciousness has been going into. And this is why in Hinduism and Buddhism, we have the concept of Maya, Maya, the state of infatuation with the material world, and, and the concept of waking yourself up in a dream to realize that reality is something else. But somehow we've been stuck in this misguided perception and we always resort to sound as the guiding force. Look what we've done, for example, with shamanism, which to me, after a all these years of understanding what is the role of sound, humans ended up by using the two most powerful tools to create something called shamanism. And these two tools are sound, music, and compounds, plants and psychedelics, with very good attention to the mindset. The mindset is not only intentions, it's intentions, attention, will, awareness, curiosity, presence of the mind, discernment, reasoning and intuition. So these are the things that we bring to any present experience through which we observe the experience and learn about who's having the experience, learn about the I, the one that labels, the one that judges. But the problem is that, as Dennis mentioned, that we have the default mode network, which in it there is all the culmination of the things that we've been impacted with. Uh, PTSD, and this should be called post-traumatic stress injury instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, which means we're dragging the past into every present moment. So there's no real presence. Sound seems to be the tool to create the presence, the equanimity, the state of psychological stability without being affected by stimuli, the, the, uh, the, the, the centeredness, the letting go of the tangent thoughts and the discursive thinking and the monkey mind, as it's called. And that's really why we always resort to music. Everybody listens to music. Why? Because it changes the way we feel. Simply music evokes emotions within us. It changes so many things through that same process of entrainment. Something outside of us is changing the way we experience reality. This is immense. So instead of creating an industry out of it, we need to learn how to use it in a very specific tool, in a very specific way as it's used as a powerful tool to create specific results. So it has a great potential, and that's what I've been studying over the years. There's so much else I can say, but I'll keep it succinct. Dennis, we, we've spoken a lot about the brain and the mind, but in terms of creating that kind of equanimity, uh, expanding our awareness into our hearts, what what kind of um, what kind of technology or what kind of um, tools do we have for that in terms of creating alignment? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, it's important to remember that the uh, the the distinction between uh, the mind and the body is really an artificial distinction. You know, this this is the legacy of Cartesianism and Cartesian duality and the idea that the mind, the consciousness, is divorced from the physical existence. And, uh, you know, that there's a realm of mental activity, mental awareness, and then there's the physical realm. This is a false uh, dualism. This is not really how it is. The mind and the body are intimately related. They are the same system. It's not that they're just interrelated. They are the same thing. 
and you can approach altered states. Uh, uh, you know, in, in fact, any profound altered state is going to affect you know your your cerebral mind, you might call it, and your heart mind. These are not separate. This is why music can elicit such profound emotions. You know, and and so you know, I think it's a misunderstanding to say that you know this technology affects the heart, this technology affects the brain. They work together. You know, and some more than others. I mean, a, a compound like MDMA, for example, helps you connect with your your heart self. It puts the emphasis there, but it's still happening through a brain process. So, I think uh, you know. It's a holistic, our consciousness is a holistic system that includes what's going on in our brain, what's going on in the rest of our our bodies, uh, uh, you know, for example, serotonin, which is uh, the main neurotransmitter that psychedelics interact with. There's more serotonin in our guts than there is in our brain, you know, and it's not without function. Those that may affect our body consciousness as well. So, you know, it's a holistic system that you're looking at. You can't really separate heart and, and brain. So when we encounter dissonance, and this question for either, when we encounter dissonance, how can we, how can we empower ourselves? Yeah, I'm going to mm. toss that one to Don. He's the expert on that. <laughs> 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 yes, well, it's important to understand what dissonance is. Dissonance is the opposite of consonance. There is harmony and disharmony, and there's we seem to be encoded with the skill to vibrate sympathetically with harmony and uh, not vibrate sympathetically with disharmony. Um, the, the harmonic series seems to be a part of our own making, the making of our brain, our entire body on the physical, mental, emotional, energetic, and spiritual levels. There's an inner guidance within us that makes us gravitate toward harmonious things. So um, this is something that uh, we're experiencing tremendously in the world, and I think that humans are on a quest to find resonance once again, to find to find that which binds us together, but there seem to be many agents that keep on separating people, whether on the socio-cultural, religious, economical, racial, political levels. And I think humans are trying harder and harder and to transcend all of these things. But um, one very important thing that we need to resort, which Dennis and I are, are deeply interested in, which is understanding the intelligence in nature, understanding uh, the role of this intelligence. And that's why we recently created um, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Dennis is the principal founder and I'm one of the co-founding co members. Uh, we're interested in natural philosophy. Natural philosophy is the place where um, science came from but unfortunately science along the way lost its connection to spirituality and now we're struggling to bring back the meta into physics so why human beings were interested in studying nature is to understand who we are what is nature to us why is nature considered to be the mother um, how to understand this intelligence that's inherent everywhere in nature which sir francis bacon the person who created the scientific method uh, called god's work not God in the Judeo-Christian terms, and this body of knowledge that is called the Logos, of which the harmonic series is the most important part that creates a different experience within us through entrainment, is called God's Word. The word, the Logos, in the Bible, is they're the same, is a mistranslation. So, it, in, in understanding nature, to understand who we are, what we are, it's really important to find back our track, to find back our connection to nature, to understand what do we do when we are in the human experience? Um, where do we take it from here? Um, and, and that connection between nature and us has been severed, and we went into great misguided perception that we're creating chaos. So when we're exposed to so much noise, so much disharmony, we create chaos. 
And that becomes the new reality, the new standard, the new consensual reality. But it does not vibrate so well with us. We end up by putting up with it, but as we realize what's going on in the world, we're reaching a dead end. And I think if it's happening, it means it's happening um, to really understand what is to be learned from this. If it's happening, there's a reason why it's happening for us to learn something that cannot be learned in any other way. So we shouldn't label it as negative. It's an opportunity to understand something that cannot be understood. And this is, again, why we are working on this collective to support people so that people don't fall into reptilian brain behavior, into disharmony, into sadness, into anger, into anxiety and fear. Why? Because it's about using the body parts in harmony. As we know, every body part has its function. Well, guess what? The brain and all the parts of the brain and Dennis eloquently often calls the brain as the three pound universe. Every part of the brain has a specific function. We've been so much falling into reptilian brain behavior. And when that happens, it starts to impinge on the limbic system, which is the middle part of the brain, the mammalian brain that's responsible for emotions. And it impinges on how reasoning discernment that takes place in the neocortex. The, the part of the brain that developed last, the biggest part of the brain, the gray matter. So we don't want reptilian brain action. That means division, separation from the other, hoarding toilet paper and whatnot, and staying home and hoarding more food and being disconnected from others. And that's the last thing that we need to do in tough times. We need to preserve harmony. We need to preserve community. We need to preserve resonance. And I think this is the most important thing. Community mm -hmm. is harmony. Alex, Alexander, uh, on a couple important points I'd just like to comment on. Uh, I think when you started talking, Alexandra, you put your finger right on it. Why do we need to understand nature? We need to understand nature because we're part of nature. And this is a, something we've lost sight of, especially in the West, especially since uh, you know, I mean, Christianity, the rise of the Abrahamic religions began this process, but then it was accelerated with the so-called enlightenment, with the emergence of the, psych of the uh, scientific method and the perspective that there is a division, there is a separation between mind and body and between us as experiencing beings in the outside world. This is an illusion. You know, uh, we are part of nature. We can't escape from it. So if we want to understand our place in nature, we have to understand what nature is. And that's really what uh, natural philosophy, the precursor of science, tries to address. Uh, the scientific method is basically valid. The, I don't, I'm not a person who advocates dismissing science, but at the same time, I think it's important to recognize its limitations. You know, uh, and what and natural philosophy comes from a place that says yes, scientific uh, approaches to understanding nature are valid but limited. We need to recognize there are other ways of knowing that we might that are equally valid that we might not consider scientific. But any way of asking questions of nature, if you if you want to phrase it that way, and getting answers back that you can evaluate for. Uh, you know, are are they do, are they legitimate? Are, do they are they really insights or are they delusions? Science is very good at separating uh, those things, but its reliance on quantitation and measurement is a limitation, because then that dismisses a whole realm of phenomena that are not so easy to measure. You know, I mean, this is this is fundamentally a limitation of neuroscience. I mean, we have very powerful uh, tools and methodologies such as neuroimaging and that sort of thing to assess what the brain does when you're, uh, you know, when you're having an experience, whether you're just sitting thinking or meditating or having a psychedelic experience or solving a mathematical problem. The, we can actually open a window on the brain now that says, well, these parts of the brains are activated, these parts are suppressed, and all this is going on. You're still 
looking from the outside in. This is the fundamental limitation of neuroscience. You can't bridge, you know, it, it still has not been able to bridge the gap between being able to look at it as a phenomenon separate from consciousness. How do we link those things? Subjective experience and what we can measure about objectively about what the brain and body is doing as we have experience with and we're having experience constantly in fact experience is the only thing we do have you know the the past is a memory and the uh, and you know the future hasn't happened yet so the future is an anticipation of what might happen the past is a memory it's gone and of course that impacts the present moment but in a certain sense the present moment is all we have that nugget that instant of experience that we're always immersed in and uh yeah so i think i think that's that's uh that's a matter and natural philosophy tries to approach this from um, I guess you could say looking at it from both the outside and the inside. And that's what's necessary if you're going to bring these things together. Mm -hmm. yes. To add one, one uh, sentence to this, it's very important to understand that what's going on in the world is not just a planetary crisis, it's a consciousness crisis. And we are being forced to, to bring back spirituality into science. And that's the reason why I believe that's the reason why we derailed. We need the spiritual science that Rudolf Steiner uh, talked so much about over 100 years ago. He's the founder of Androposophy and uh, Waldorf School System. Uh, it's, it's very important to understand consciousness fully. And, and yes, using science, but science is still wearing an invisible straight jacket because it does not address the spiritual aspect of being and we as human beings when we don't know enough we always look outside we don't look inside and spirituality is always about looking inward something that the collective is promoting tremendously so by applying yeah. our, our experiences we we gain we cultivate an uh, agency we're able to uh, create more impact, organize better, be more available, be more balanced in terms of uh, our inner and outer perceptions, be more integrated into our lives, our society. You were going to say, Dennis. Dennis, did you have Dennis, something you wanted, to add? Yeah, did you have a comment? I had a comment, but it, forget it. <laughs> I'll think of it. <laughs> okay. Here. Sure. So it's very important well, to to uh, realize that uh, meditation, contemplation, mindfulness are important because they inform us about who we are, who's having the experience, who am I, what am I? These are the two of the most important questions anyone can ask. Who's having the experience? Uh, and there are more and more new scientific models that show us that our perception caused us to try to understand how consciousness came after the Big Bang. And some of these models are explaining to us and presenting that the universe is a product of our consciousness. And then we tap into what Eastern philosophies have been saying all along for thousands of years. Patriarchy came and changed things around and it was cemented with the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And now we pray to a God that's outside of us and he's a male God. And that's quite contradictory to what Eastern philosophies have been promoting. So, uh, and we severed our connection to nature. The feminine has been disempowered. The feminine side in men and women, the right hemisphere of the brain and the heart, and same with women and women in general were disempowered. And the ultimate archetype, uh, feminine archetype, nature, has been disempowered tremendously. So so many things happened that caused this misguided perception to lead us to this point where we created chaos in our planet this animal and plant extinction and crazy weather and climate and humans are killing each other over which way is best to worship jehovah and you know we've gone mad and we're not labeling it as that what what is causing this to happen what is the point what what do we need to understand we need to ask these questions because we're not asking them enough we need to understand um, the human condition 
with compassion and empathy and, and not without pointing fingers that Yes, so we can break out of this system of domination, competition, and mm -hmm. restore a balance where we're relating cooperatively and in partnership with each other, with nature. So I'm yeah. curious in terms of, this comes back to coherence, right, Dar Dennis? Is that uh, we are, and resonance as well, Alexander, that coherence and resonance coming into these kinds of states of flow are possible through either uh, stepping out of the box in terms of psychedelic experiences, but also being uh, receiving signal uh, through the noise, which sound offers uh, transcendently of whichever box we're in. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering in, in terms of kind of closing now, how, how, does, how is natural philosophy bringing that forward? How, how is it um, integrating, integrating our ability to exist better? Well, I, I think uh, how natural philosophy, um, it, it's a, natural philosophy is really a, a, a tool or a set of techniques for learning how to use our minds, you know, you, how to think, essentially, you know, outside of the, without, I mean, I think it's important, you know, to recognize that the divisiveness and the, all of that that's going on, in some way you can look at that as, and we're all in some kind of box, right? And sometimes the boxes do not agree with each other. And very often they don't. So you're, the box you're in may not be the box I'm in or the box Alexander is in or other people. And rather than natural philosophy uh, offers us an opportunity to look at that dispassionately and say, what is, what is working? What is the difference between these different worldviews? And... I think uh, you have to grant initially that whatever box we're in, we don't have the complete picture, you know, so it's always incomplete because this is a construction that our minds make. It is not a reflection of reality. And if you start with that as a fundamental premise, then that's the first step toward getting out of your box, you know, or reconstructing the box so that it's a little more reflective of other people's point of view and, and uh, you know, what might be reality. There's no way to know actually uh, objectively for certain what reality is because we're always living in a model of reality that may or may not more or less reflect what actual reality is. And that's the trick. How do you test that? How do you actually, you know, establish uh, the validity of, say, a point of view or an understanding that that you know does depend on you and your point of view? And I think that's that's what we have to do. Alexandre put it essentially: if we're going to understand ourselves, we have to understand nature, and that's the that's the shift. And then we have to revise our models so that our worldviews are more in harmony with nature you know for example in science i mean here's a maybe trivial example but in science uh, formally looking at evolution and these various processes it's always been about uh, natural selection and competition and survival of the fittest and conflict and all that that's not the way nature works by and large. You know, we now understand that symbiosis and collaboration and intimate, intricate, intimate and intricate relations between different species, uh, which is symbiosis, close association of different species for mutual benefit, that is how nature works most of the time. I mean, sure, there is competition, but that's not the... Uh, you know, that's not the only mechanism that drives evolution forward. Symbiosis is much more important for that. And so uh, natural philosophy gives us uh, an opportunity to look at that. And I think another interesting, important point, I guess we're running out of time, but an important point that Alexandre makes, and I'd like to say about psychedelics, science has been at pains for about 200 years to exorcise spirituality from science, to establish the premise that, well, we're just complex machines. 
you know, we're just atoms moving around and, you know, organisms, living things are just complex machines. There really is no life force. There really is no spirituality. Psychedelics come along and they have forced biomedicine to acknowledge that there is a spiritual dimension of experience. You know, that's what these things do. They treat the spirit. You can't treat the spirit unless you acknowledge that it exists. So that's why psychedelics are so important in terms of their potential to completely revolutionize our understanding of mental illness, uh, of healing, of what medicine should be, and develop a, a new medicine, a revolutionary medicine that treats both the mind and the body. And uh, that's the medicine of, of the future. And uh, again, as Alexander has, has pointed out, at just as much with as psychedelics are important here, sound is important here, and the combination of them. Sound is the medicine of the future as well. So we're we're getting there, but you know we're monkeys, so we don't learn very quickly. Yeah. But we get there. <laughs> but we do have the medicine, yeah. so that's encouraging. That's a source of strength. Yes. A closing closing mm -hmm. thought, Alexandre. Yeah. Yes, uh, I totally agree with what Dennis said, and and it's important also to transcend these taboos about psychedelics and, and to demonize them. If you really un want to understand what's important for human beings, just go around in the world and see what people have been working on. Intuitive intelligence is above all scientific experiments, because if we want to do a study, that study is going to be limited to what we already know. We need to understand reality, what impacts reality. Well, guess what impacts reality? Our conditioned mind, education, uh, the way we perceive things, the way we label and name things. And we end up by uh, seeing that which we know, and we don't make room for that which we don't know. So um, it's very important to trust the intuitive intelligence, also to realize how much the fact that humans fell ill for prioritizing profit over consciousness created so much derailment and it became about money and this is something we're facing right now and unfortunately this is a big problem but that also the fact that people have been prioritizing profit over consciousness and not realizing the detriment of the consequences caused the reptilian brain and money sings well to the reptilian brain invites more um, interaction with everything we do cause this for us to behave in a very imbalanced way without using the brain and harmony. Uh, sound, the original harmony, the pure harmony, seems to be showing us where the misguided perception went wrong and how everything is perception, everything is based on labeling. But it's very important to um, uh, receive the education in the proper way. In the old days, people studied the trivium and quadrivium. And when you do that, I'm not going to get into details, something I talk about on my website. Um, people can check this out, soundmeditation.com. But it's really, we no longer have the right education to properly um, create the neuroplasticity that would help us understand who we are. There's something new now in science called connectum harmonic. That means the brain is wired in a very specific way, whether we grow along those lines or we grow the brain against it. So we need to, as, as a whole, I think humanity is trying to work together as, it's, as if it's one big organism in harmony and to understand who we are. And we have not been doing good job at doing that. However, it's happening for a reason for us to learn something that cannot be learned in any other way. So let's focus on that and not see it as a detriment. Yes, and we, we have certainly places we can turn to in nature and uh, natural systems, natural models, where we can see those harmonics operating. Luckily, we ha we nature shows us trophic cascades, for instance, uh, as well as the incurrence in of the connectome and how harmonics are used in our own brains. Not to mention that we don't have to look far in terms of uh, how we cooperate in, in hosting as a host body for billions and billions of other organisms as a, a holobion, our own, our own system. Well, thank you both. We, we have to wrap this up. This has been an incredible conversation. Really, really a pleasure to speak with each, each of you. Keep up the excellent work. We hope to see you uh, back with us, Dennis, at SoundMind. We 
we're so excited about we're starting and congratulations on the McKenna Academy both um, such a source of inspiration and um, powerful powerful new to tools and thinking so thank you both uh, thank you very stay much tuned. We, yes look forward to participating thank you